Coming up next is Dr. Kimberly Taylor. Here's your chance to talk about what matters to you. Although you will receive helpful advice from Dr. Taylor, remember, this is not to be construed as a form of psychotherapy, diagnosis, or treatment, and cannot replace a therapeutic relationship with a mental health professional. You can reach Dr. Taylor by calling 564-1290 or toll free at 866-564-1290. You can also listen live on the internet at drkimtaylorshow.com. So here now is Dr. Kimberly Taylor. Are you happy? Everyone wants to be happy, but what's keeping you from being happy right now? Do you know that what typically gets in the way for most people is they have a list of things and it's long and it's the things that they need to do or have or achieve before they will really allow themselves to be happy. You've heard the statements and you've probably said them yourself. They sound something like this. I will be happy when I find a new job, when I get a raise, when I find someone special, when I get my health back, when I buy a home, when I graduate. But despite getting it, you're still not happy because you tack on something else that you have to wait for or achieve before happiness will be yours. With this kind of strategy, all of one's life can be spent in really preparing to be happy someday in the future. But how many moments have you let slip by, not allowing yourself to really feel happy from within in the present moment? I want to help you to change that today. I am here with my guest, Marilyn Tam. And she is a speaker, consultant. She's a board-certified executive corporate leadership coach. She's the founder and executive director of US Foundation. She was formerly the CEO of Aveda Corporation, president of Reebok, vice president of Nike, and also a successful entrepreneur who has developed and built four companies. And today she's coming to us as the author of The Happiness Choice. Now, this is a great book. It's filled with stories, tips, and a lot of insights on how anyone can live the life they've dreamed of living. And so I am so pleased that she is with us here to share these tips with us. Welcome to the program, Marilyn. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Well, you have been very, very uh, busy in your life, and for you to find the way to be happy through all of this, I think, is a very important insight for us all to kind of clue into and to find out how it happens. You uh, did start this book by talking about how people look for happiness in all the wrong places. Can you explain what happiness is and what it's not? Thank you for that that explanation, and, and because you started it, it when your introduction about how so many of us pause and wait for something else to happen before we allow ourselves to be happy, and when that is happening, that's that's suspending or delaying what we can choose to have right now, which is happiness. Because happiness is not something that, out, that comes from outside of us. It's something within ourselves. It is when we feel that inner peace, when we feel the voices and know that the voices on our head, <laughs> all the judgmental voices, are slowed down because we're then in the present, in the flow, and say, this moment here is where I am and I am comfortable with it. So the definition of happiness really has to come back to saying, this is all I can do. I can't do anything but that happened before. All the 
regrets or, or anger or frustration or judgment or resentment, that's past. We can only live now. And we can't worry so much about the future because that hasn't happened yet. And we are still here in this moment able to change it. So in those two, recognizing the dimensions of life, that we can only be here now, we can choose to be happy. So you are really talking about that we have to be in the present moment to find this. And that is it something that actually we find or is it how we think about what's present in front of us? If you answered it yourself, it's the latter. And I, I want to use an example of somebody who had such a horrific outside experience and you were still at peace and happy. And that is Viktor Frankl, mm-hmm. Man's Search for Meaning. I'm sure you're quite familiar with the author. And he was a, a psychiatrist and also a Holocaust uh, survivor. And he writes about this in his book, how when he was in in the concentrate, you know, Auschwitz, and how he didn't know anybody else that he loved, where they were, where they were still alive, and yet holding to that moment saying, I have a purpose, I know why I'm here, and this moment I can choose to be happy. And that's saying a lot because, you know, Mm -hmm. the situation is so outrageously poor. And he, the, the wonderful thing he said also is he said, the people who are optimists, meaning, oh, tomorrow's going to be fine and we're going to be let out, those people died first. And because they just, they, when the next day came and it wasn't what they expected, they were so uh, depressed about that, that that they gave up, you know, the spirit. Or people who were really thinking a real bad pessimists who thought, everything is going to get worse, it did get worse for them because they were looking only for the negative to happen. But for him, being centered in himself and saying, I can choose this moment, this is the only moment I have, I can choose how I want to feel. So even in those circumstances, he was at peace and happy, and he survived, obviously, and to enough to share all his wisdom with all of us. Mm-hmm. So what you are saying is that happiness is really in our hands. So can we learn to see things in a positive way to make us happy? Yes, and that's really the, 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 the choice that we have. How do we look at whatever we are in, uh, facing? In Victor Franco's case, there seems to be no way out. Uh, he is completely imprisoned uh, in, in his physical being and his uh, emotions was being bombarded by all these people who were telling him he's going to die and all the horrible things that happened in in the Holocaust. Yet he said, they cannot control my mind and my heart. And that's where we go. We have a choice. Once we recognize we have a choice of how we look at each moment in our lives, no matter how grim it might be looking from the outside, we have an opportunity to shift it then because we're saying, this is what it is now, but it doesn't have to continue to be like this. Or... Where is the good out of this? How can I find something good out of this situation, whatever it might be? Do you know, one of the things that I was really touched about with your story, and that you did list it as one of the defining moments for you, when you really knew what your life uh, mission would be, that you were a child of 11 years old, and you were standing with your friend. Can you tell us about that? Rebecca, she changed my life because until 11 years old, I, 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 I didn't feel super happy in a lot of ways. And, and of course, because my family didn't want another girl, they had already had my sister and I had three younger brothers and being a Chinese traditional family living in Hong Kong, girls were not valued. And so I had been abused and, and uh, basically treated pretty uh, miserably, <laughs> including being given away to my aunt and uncle and then them having a, a boy and shipping me back to my family. Mm. So in terms of self-esteem or <laughs> what, what one would normally call happiness, it's not exactly high on the list. But when I met Rebecca, my little school classmate, and I found out that she and her whole family lived in a room and they shared a kitchen and a bathroom with two more families, and by the end, close to the end of the month, they didn't have enough food to eat. And however bad I had it, I always had enough food. 
And I couldn't understand why two working parents working full time could not afford to feed their family. It didn't seem fair. It didn't seem right. And I was going to do something about it. And Rebecca, in her own life experience, taught me that I have a choice. I can do something different. I can help others. And so that defined my life and gave me what became my life purpose. I found it when I was young, and I'm very grateful for that. So that, in fact, really helped to shape you and to challenge you to move forward in your own life. Absolutely. And then it gave me a reason for why I was born. Everybody has a a reason why they were born. And when we find that reason, because a lot of times because of all that the outside noises, whether it's from uh, the media or from your teachers or from your minister or from your family, all telling you what you should do to be happy, we forget that we really know what we have to do to be happy. And it's go back inside and listen to that wisdom inside to know what is our life purpose, why are we here. Once we figure that out and we follow that path, happiness is just the natural result. So you really went from being a child who felt very unwanted to being someone who, when you found that purpose, you finally uh, discovered why you were here. Exactly. And we all have a good reason for being here. Even, And it may be very different from each person, but our reason for being is what's going to propel us forward and support us, even in times when we think that life is so bleak. Mm-hmm. I think for most people, they actually know that they have to find something or that they have to find a way to make themselves feel happy or purposeful in in their life. You came across Dr. Martin Siegelman, who is the founder of Positive Psychology, and he talks about there are actual dimensions of well-being. Can you discuss those? Oh, he is a wonderful teacher, and, and as you talked about, there's the five levels. Do you want to shout, start with them, or do you want me to just dive in, to, uh, be fun for us to kind of have a dialogue about each one? Sure. Well, I think the first one is that pleasure that induces positive emotions, like great food or uh, creature comforts or sex or doing things that are good for others. That really is a way for people to feel really good about themselves, so that giving to others makes us feel better in return. Absolutely. And and that's so true. And that, as you said, is the first level of happiness. It's just, uh, it could be, look at it as maybe more temporary of just saying, okay, I'm eating good food and this tastes good and that gives me pleasure. But one of the other ones you said, which is about, about giving back to others, that's a deeper sense of happiness because we are into a way of sharing and connecting and, and giving. And research has shown, I'm so sure you can uh, attest to it even more, is that how when we share, when we connect and give, the, the result in happiness is much more uh, deep and lasting. Mm-hmm. And what does he mean when he talks about engagement? And that's sort of what we're talking about, having the connections. As I say in my book, The Happiness Choice, we were born needing help completely. We're just helpless. And then when we die or close to death, we also need help uh, to, to do many things. So in between time, in between time when we're able body and, and able to do a lot of things, we cannot forget that the connection, that engagement is critical to our well-being because that's we are social animals. We are uh, we live in community, and once we forget that, we can never be happy. So we have to go back to that engagement, the connection with our community, whether it's your family, your neighborhood, your company, your country, and ultimately the world. Mm-hmm. What I think we've all read, is that people who are more engaged with others, people who find meaning and purpose in their life by giving or feeling like they have a gift to give to others, probably live the longest and feel the happiest. Right. And what about reaching goals then? It still is about being able to have goals. What you're saying in your book is that you have to be happy every step of the way and find something to be happy about instead of waiting to be happy 
after you get to the goal. Exactly. And because the goal is always going to be changing because I'm sure when we were young, our goals were more limited because that's how we could see. As we grow, the goals get bigger and bigger. And, and a good example is um, our concept about money. When we're at a certain point, we say, okay, when I have X dollars, then I'm going to be happy, I'm going to be comfortable, I'm going to be wealthy. And when we reach X dollars, the next thing we say is, well, only we have two X, then we will really be happy. <laughs> and the goal changes. We have to be happy this moment. I have half X, and I'm happy because this is what I have, and I can celebrate that. And whatever happens, we can't predict the future. We can only be happy with now. In your book, you actually even take this a step further to put like a sixth step here that you have to address the body and find a inner balance through exercise, nutrition, and feeling healthy. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, first thing we talked about already is having a life purpose, using that as our guide. And then there are five different aspects of our life. The first one that most people focus on because we're in a monetary economy is about money. And that gives one, one aspect of our life. Another one, of course, is our body. Because usually what happens is when people spend all their time making money and they ruin their health, then they try to spend the money trying to, deal with, <laughs> trying to get their health back. And between those two, the third thing people deal with is their relationships. By the time they spend all their time making money or dealing with their health, they, if they neglect the relationships, then they're going to start <laughs> money and the energy to to bring their relationships back. And, and after that, even with all those being somewhat balanced, if people don't have an inner core, some belief of something greater, whether a person is a, is a believer in a specific religion, or even people who are atheists, they have a firm belief in something. And that something is going to be what keeps us centered so that there's content connection with the bigger whole. And the last one, which we kind of touch on already, is community. How do we connect with and how do we give back to community? So those are the aspects of life we have to have in dynamic balance. Because at every time, every stage in our lives, and, and thankfully in today's day we can go back and forth between different stages, is that we have an opportunity to to rebalance the, the, the five aspects we talked about, money and other means of exchange, our physical body, our relationships, um, our, our uh, spiritual beliefs, and also our community. Those aspects of life change in allocation at different times in our life, but the truth is we need to have them all in some sort of dynamic balance for us to be truly aligned and be happy. So what would you say to those who don't have that balance yet, who all of this is not in alignment, who might, you know, not have enough money or their relationship is not in a good place right now or they're in poor health? Mm. Well, first to say, welcome to the club. I don't yeah. think- <laughs> welcome to life. <laughs> it is a lot of people, or most people, have sometimes in their lives be out of balance. That is just... The, the, the dynamic uh, things that happen in the world and in our lives. And knowing that, then we can say, okay, let's get back to a place of balance. But the first thing to do is to recognize what is, take a pause, to step back enough to have a chance to, to be a little detached from whatever the drama that we're experiencing. And in that place, then come back and say, okay, what do I have? positive as well as negative, and then have the, the assessment and, and enough distance to say, all right, this is how I can move forward to the next step. How, what resources do I have? What are the situations and, and support that I have? What are the challenges I have? And then from there, we can start to assess what needs to be done based on what our life purpose is, why, what drives us to keep going. So if we know and put all the things that we have happening in our lives into perspective to say, okay, this is the challenge, these are the resources, these are the opportunities, and this is what I really believe is important for me, then we can make the decisions and the action 
and ask for the help that we need to move forward. Okay, I'm here with Marilyn Tam. She's the author of The Happiness Choice, and we will be right back after a short break. I'm Kimberly Taylor, and you're listening to KZSB AM 1290. I am here with Marilyn Tam, and she's the author of The Happiness is a Choice. And we are talking about how no matter what the circumstances are of your life, that by changing your perspective, that you can actually find the happiness within yourself. So with all of the talk that we've been doing, we've been talking about all these things that you need to focus on on yourself and for yourself in order to make yourself happy. So here's my question to you. Is it selfish to take care of yourself first? And I have to say absolutely not. Because, I mean, how many, how many times have we heard it? We don't even hear it anymore. When we get on a plane and we sit down, and what do they say? Put your own oxygen mask on before you help somebody else. And that's why do they say that? It's because if we don't take care of ourselves, we will not be able to help others. And when we are not happy, we are not as creative, we are not as productive, and we are not as um, healthy, physically healthy. So it's very important for us to take care of the first person that we have an impact over ourselves before we move on to anybody else. And it's not just some kind of nice concept because I've worked with uh, Gallup Research, Jim Harden, who is the head of research, as well, uh, um, who has an annual productivity and happiness index. They call it the wellness index. And what it is is they measure the well-being and happiness or lack of thereabouts and work, and they've shown that in 2013, last year, the most recent results, that we in America alone lost $550 billion, B, with a B, <laughs> billion dollars, mm. in, un, in lost productivity due to unhappiness. So our own well-being and happiness makes a difference to everything that we do and how we interact with the world. So taking care of ourselves is vital. Do you know, when I'm sitting with a a patient in my office and we're talking about this concept about whether it is uh, selfish to take care of of yourself first, what I say about that is that serving yourself first really serves the world at large in a very positive way because then you're bringing a positive view and a and a very positive attitude to whatever it is that you're doing in in the world. So it's really the most selfless thing that we can do is to take care of ourselves first and stop waiting for somebody else to do that job. Exactly. And I'm so glad that you're sharing that message with, with your patients and to our listeners here, because that is something that is so hard, especially for women to, to hear, because we've been conditioned in our culture to deny ourselves and help uh, and do other things for our people first. So tell us a bit about what is the uh, difference between women and men, because both of them see this a little bit differently. And uh, you wrote about this in, in your book. Yes. Um, in, let's just say, 40 years ago, thereabouts, women were, had a, a set of roles, um, traditional roles. We were supposed to be a good daughter. We grow up. We marry some nice man, we're supposed to have these great children and take care, of, be the, the mother, the wife, the nurturer, and the community volunteer. And that was our role. And in the last 40 years, what has shifted is that that role has stayed intact in our consciousness, but at the same time, the culture and the society has shifted our, our, our perspective and what is expected of women to the fact that they are supposed to, or we are supposed to also have a, have a job uh, uh, outside of the home where we earn an income. And then also on the same time, we're supposed to be articulate and know about social affairs as well as, um, as, well as to look good doing it. Mm-hmm. And that's just too many roles for anybody, just for any one person to do. So it just confuses the woman's brain. And what happens is we are 
in a place where we're always feeling inadequate and always feeling like we don't have everything done and that we are not good enough. And this has been decreasing the absolute level of absolute as well as relative level of happiness for women in in relationship and in comparison to men globally in all the developed nations. And so men really have it easier, uh, correct? That they're not as tied to some of the the roles of the past? Um, Men have it easier, but just a little bit. Because in the old days, all they had to do was go out and, and bring back the bacon. Right. And when they come home, you know, they get the the cocktail. That's the thing you always see on TV. <laughs> they get the cocktail and they get the easy chair and the slippers. Uh-huh. And they didn't have to do much else. But nowadays, they are still supposed to be the one out there getting the bacon or, or the vegetables, if you're vegetarian <laughs> like I am. Uh, but... <laughs> Um, but the other part of it is that they are also supposed to help around the house, be, take care, uh, you know, support the children, and, and be more involved. And the m- most frightening thing is that all of a sudden they are supposed to learn about their own emotions and have a deeper level of engagement on, on things that until this point they really didn't have to think about. So they also have issues around how to be how to juggle and balance all the roles that they now have. So for all of us, men and women, we actually need to come to a higher level of agreement and and change the paradigm that we're all living in. How do we, uh, to use a common phrase now, how do we lean in equally on both sides? Okay, so we do need to change, but what do we need to do first? Give us a hint about what we can do first about this so that we can kind of put down these impossible lists that we need to accomplish and the things that we need to get done. What do we need to do first? Well, for each individual, it's aligned with first why you're here. And then if if you're in a relationship with with a a spouse or a child or whatever, then what, or your community or your company, find the common agreement. What is the common uh, perspective here for us to all agree on. What is the common purpose in this group? Is it um, agree to whatever it is that, that binds you in that group? With that place, then we can say, okay, based on that, what can we do now, now that we know the common goal here? How can we move that forward? And then each person can then bring their talents, their interests, and, and their passion to that story and to that conversation and make it happen. And what is the uh, connection between happiness and gratefulness? Oh, that is such a good question because the first thing, when, when we are feeling less than happy, the first way to get out of it is by giving gratitude. I can share a story. You know, when I was um, in my 30s, my husband went out mountain biking one day and had a sudden heart attack and died. Mm. And so instead of going out to brunch, I was, at the ER, being told that my husband had died is completely without preparation, without any warning, and devastated me. Mm-hmm. And I honestly didn't think I could even get out of bed because it just it seemed like hopeless. I, I didn't know how to deal because nobody expects to to be a widow when you're in their 30s. And so for me, after walking around for I don't know how long in my PJs most of the time because I just couldn't even get out of the house, I said, okay, I can't keep living like this because I have to get out of this place because I'm spiraling down. I don't know how far I can go. I said, okay, what can I do to get out of this place? And what I felt like I could do was I had to give gratitude. Mm. So before I got up every morning and every t- every night when I laid down again, I made myself give five reasons to give thanks. And at first, it's really hard. And I'm telling people, believe me, I understand, when, when, when I tell you this and you say, there's nothing to be thankful for, mm-hmm. there are. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I had to look for the smallest little thing. It could be a similar thing. Well, I don't take very long to get uh, dressed in the morning. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it's just simple little things. But finding five things, by the time I get done with five, mm-hmm. I've moved from the bottom of the abyss to at least, you know, a few rungs higher. And, and with time, with giving gratitude, 
it really helped me to regain back some some degree of equanimity and inner peace and happiness and to re- recognize that no matter how bad I have it, I still have so much. That is incredible. One thing that I thought of while you said that is that quote that in the darkest time, the eye begins to see. So we are going to take a quick break here. We'll be right back with Marilyn Tam. I'm Kimberly Taylor, and you're listening to KZSB AM 1290. I'm here with Marilyn Tam, and she has written the book, The Happiness Choice. We're talking about how by changing your perspective and making a choice to be happy and to being more conscious about it, that you actually can change the way that you feel about your life. Marilyn, one of the things that you also talked about is that you need to have a relationship with yourself first, and that sometimes... We need to remove the obstacles that get in our own way. Can you talk a little bit about the concept and the work that you did with Catherine Woodward Thomas? Mm -hmm. A lot of times we carry with us past baggage, what people have told us before, or resentments we have carried from other relationships, or judgments that we've made about ourselves, as well as what we took on from others. And until we release all that... We are not present to what is. And so we make judgments and we make decisions and we behave and think in ways that really isn't the best for us because we don't really know who we are. We are just living somebody else's lives. It seems like uh, many people who look like they have everything going for them can be more unhappy than those who have very little. So how do you explain this? And That's... And I can verify that because in my work of speaking and consulting with Fortune 100 companies and the top leaders there, you have people who have phenomenal wealth. They have the the dream job. Um, they have all the assets that we, we, we normally associate with the super life, you know, the third home, the third car, the third spouse, <laughs> and everything else. And they're unhappy because they're not really living the life that, that is really serving themselves. They are just living what society has told them that is what's going to make them happy. And sometimes they don't even know what makes them happy. Yet somebody else, and having worked with many uh, De La Fabric Nations uh, from my foundation and my own work, uh, in some of the poorest places in the world, in Bhutan especially, when I started working there in the early 2000s, the average GDP per person in the country was less than $200 a year. And I had never met any, a group of people that was happier. And why? It's because they have an inner core of knowing their place in relationship to each other and to the world, and they were living very present and in today. And so... Money itself doesn't give you that happiness. It is understanding and knowing who you are and why you're here and what you're doing about it. So one of the first things is you definitely do have to have that relationship with yourself, and you have to find your own gifts and your own passion. You also talk about one of the other constructs would be about friendships. Mm -hmm. How does that help you in your life? What part does it play in your happiness? Friendships is, is a chance to have that, that inner support reflected from outside sources. So in, in the case of having people who, who can be a mirror for you in different aspects of your life and also be a sounding board, but also to give us that community and that connection that we as human beings desire, and actually all animals um, desire that connection. So... Friends give us that support and connection and, and, and boost when we need it. And uh, something to add is that sometimes we think that friends take a lot of effort and time. Just find people who are about the same level of engagement as you and then develop what, what my friend Jan says to me, develop high, 
high reward, low maintenance relationship. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that a lot. Um, one of the other constructs is money, that people tie their self-worth to how much money they make. So how can they unravel those kind of ties? And, and that's a, such a, a one that seems like, especially in, uh, in our world now, is so connected that we sometimes don't even realize that it's tied. So the first thing is to recognize that, oh, I'm measuring myself by how much money I make or what kind of car I drive or what kind of house I have, what kind of clothes I have. Recognize that first. So that's the first step. Once you recognize that and say, okay, let's run that out. Are you really going to be happier if you have another car or another, a bigger house or whatever it is that we're measuring ourselves by? And then go, come back and say, what's most important? Is that what I would expect somebody to say about me after I die? Oh, they have the biggest house or uh, they have the most money. And then we realize how futile that is. People are not going to say that. Mm-hmm. We're going to say, did they make a difference in the world? Did they help people? Did they make us laugh? Did they plant a garden? Did they raise good children? Did they create something wonderful for the world? It's all about what we can give back. So once we shift the thinking and just realize that it's not how much we amass, it's what we can do to share and give. I like that. The next one was to really believe in something, that you have to have some, some sort of spiritual a belief. So let us know what you mean by that and how that also helps. Because when we are living on this physical plane, and we all live on the physical plane, and we, we walk on the ground and we, we eat food and, and we're in the physical plane, but there's something missing that is intrinsic in all of, of, all of us human beings. And that is that there's a call, an inner call to something greater than ourselves. And because even for the person who has, quote, everything, uh, material-wise, there's a hollowness that comes from us that doesn't sustain us if we don't have that greater whole. And it's been shown, as we talked about a little earlier, in that sense of belief, even, say, like in Victor Frankl's case, in, in the in the Auschwitz and in these concentration camps is that the way to survive outside disaster is to have the inner wisdom of knowing there's something greater than ourselves that is connecting, that we're connecting with. And I even say this even for an atheist, because an atheist is really believing that there's nothing. So the belief is strong that there's something, even if it's nothing. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, we do have to take one of those uh, pesky breaks again, so we'll be right back with Marilyn Tam. I'm Kimberly Taylor, and you're listening to KZSB AM 1290. If you are looking for a good book to read, I would have you read The Happiness Choice. It's by author Marilyn Tam, and she has been with us for the hour here. And I have a last question here for you, is that how does... Being happy, finding your own happiness, how can this change the world? And that is such a wonderful question. Thank you so much for asking it, because collectively the world is nothing but each one of us, to, each one of us gathered together. So once we recognize that we are part of the whole, and the whole is really us, then we can recognize why our own influence can make such a difference. And as I said in my book, The Happiness Choice, we influence... Um, uh, our own connection, our own happiness can impact out to two or three levels past us. So how a person is feeling and thinking can impact not only the person they inter- interact with, but the person who the person they interact with is interacting with. So how we maintain and think and act influences multiplies greatly. And so if we all start thinking positive thoughts and we all get into a place of doing things that that align with our own happiness, the world's going to shift. And this is being spoken by a, a woman who was a child who did not feel loved when she was born, who did not feel loved within her family. And yet here you are, you are someone who has kind of risen up and have really brought all of this positive feeling to all of these, whether it's a a business or the people that you have met. So it must be a very powerful thing that we all can do. 
Thank you, and, and thank you for your work, because I know you are helping so many people shift their consciousness to one where they know that they have a choice and they can act and, and choose differently to be happy and to be healthy. All right, so are there any last words you will tell people out there who are wondering whether this actually, by doing this work on themselves and changing their perspective, how this can work for them? I, I, I assure you, as you said, having lived through my experiences, and not just mine, but like Victor Franco, we talk, spoke about, and, and many other leaders and teachers in, in the world who have endured hardship and they have chosen to be happy and have, they have completely changed the world. And if they need more resources, they also, of course, welcome to go to my website, MarilynTam.com, where I have a lot of free uh, videos, audios, print, even recipes for, to support them in their, in their choice to be happy. So MarilynTam.com, and it's free. Great. There is one quote which I would like to share. It was a Cherokee saying, and it was, When you were born, you cried and the world rejoiced. Live your life so that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. I thought that was wonderful. Thank you. I I really love that quote because that's the truth. Let's just realize that we have a choice and then we want to live a life so that when we die, we do rejoice, and then the, the world feels like that they've lost somebody that has contributed beautifully to it. Marilyn Tam, thank you very much for being here. I will be right back with some closing thoughts. I'm Kimberly Taylor, and you're listening to KZSB AM 1290. Thank you for listening to this program. I want to let you know that if you want to hear it again, you can go to my website at drkimtaylorshow.com or go to iTunes and download the podcast. Or you can listen to the rebroadcast right here at KZSB AM 1290. It's Thursday evenings at 10 p.m. and Sundays at 9 a.m. And I will also list Marilyn Tam's information on my website for you to be able to find her also. I am Dr. Kim Taylor, and I hope that you will join me live next Thursday afternoon at 2 to 3, where we will be celebrating the one-year anniversary of this show. So I don't want you to miss it. Mark your calendars now. Just a side note, I find that I am most happy and alive when I feel that I'm making a positive difference in my own life, whether it's taking care of myself and those I love or following my life's purpose to reach out and to help others to find their highest potentials. There was a great mentor of mine who once said, the purpose of life is to discover your gift, and the meaning in life comes in giving it away. I encourage you all to take the steps to find your own happiness and to gain the life you've always dreamed of. So stop waiting. You can choose to be happy right now. And with that in mind, remember, no one else has to change in order for you to get better. And I will see you next Thursday.